Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel. I hope you're all doing well and having a fantastic week. In today's video, I'm really excited to have three special guests with me to talk all about parrot nutrition. So we've got David, the parrot teacher. We've got Dr. Jamie Abate, who is an avian vet. And we've got our good friend, Dr. Jason Crean as well. So uh, I'm gonna have everyone introduce themselves. Hopefully you've seen some of our interviews and collaborations on the channel already. If not, there'll be a playlist link somewhere on the screen and down in the description as well. So David, introduce yourself. Hi, you I'm David. <laughs> I'm from the parrot team. Teacher, my own YouTube channel. Me and Sophie work together at uh, Best Behaved Birds, helping parrots. Uh, we have a lovely flock of seven parrots. We just love parrots. We <laughs> love educating people. I come from an educational background. So to educate about parrots, which I love, and continue educating was amazing for me, and I love doing it. Yeah, awesome. Uh, Dr. Jamie, could you introduce yourself and what you sure. do? Um, my name is Jamie Abadie. Uh, I'm a veterinarian. I work in Niles, Illinois at Niles Animal Hospital and Bird Medical Center. Um, I've also raised and kept birds for probably about 30 years now. Uh, so uh, I have a lot of experience in the bird field. Awesome. And Jason? I'm Jason Crean, a biologist. I teach. Um, I'm a professor of biology at St. Xavier University in Chicago, though I live in Orlando with our um, diverse flock of research animals, um, all birds uh, of different species that we um, kind of keep an eye on to see how nutrition's affecting their lives. Um, I've kept birds since I was 12, so that was a long time ago. I'm not gonna give years, but um, <laughs> it was a very, very long time ago when I started breeding cockatiels at age 12, and uh, that practical experience led me to do what I'm doing today. Amazing. Well, thank you all so much for being here today. I really appreciate the time and I'm really excited to talk all about nutrition. It's something I'm really passionate about. And Jason and I have had various discussions on the channel before about it. Um, and one of the burning questions that uh, keeps coming up uh, in my comments, my messages is what are avian vets actually taught in vet school about nutrition? Because we hear lots of different recommendations from different vets about what's appropriate for our parrots at home. So Jamie, if you wouldn't mind starting off with what are vets actually taught about avian nutrition in vet school? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so most vets aren't really taught a lot about birds in general. So that being said, it's even less about avian nutrition. Um, what we are taught to tell people is that they should be on a primarily pelleted diet, a primarily uh, formulated diet that's like 90% and then the 10% fresh uh, foods that are healthy human foods or fruits and vegetables. Um, so really not not much beyond that. And that's basically uh, done out of convenience because they don't really go further into what birds need um, in vet school. And it's literally like one course that is exotic medicine where birds are just a portion of that course. Um, so it's really not very in depth, unfortunately. And Jason, what are you seeing when you're sort of talking to vets and presenting at kind of vet conferences? What are you seeing? What are vets kind of saying to you about their recommendations? Yeah, when I'm when I'm asked to speak at vet schools, um, it's very clear that there's not a focus on on birds, let alone bird nutrition. Um, I remember talking to an avian uh, vet um, at a conference several years ago, and she's like, "Well, what do we get? One day of parrot nutrition?" You know, and she was joking, but she was she was being honest. Um, so you know, and and they are taught that processed food, and it really doesn't matter what species, that processed food is the be all end all, and, and that should form the base of the diet, which, you know, obviously um, science itself doesn't promote when you look at the decades of research on what happens to food when you process it. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on what you um, I don't have any thoughts on that, but I do have thoughts on how little information is actually up excuse me, formal information is out there to learn about even nutrition. Now, we're lucky we met you, Jason, because that advanced our knowledge even further. You know, we were researching as much as we could ourselves, but there's loads of different sources you're not so sure who to trust. And when we found you and started doing your course, that helped us a lot. And it's a shame there isn't more funding, more in general, to promote avian nutrition and research into it. Yeah, for sure. And as Jamie kind of touched upon, and Jason as well, you know, the main diet that is being pushed by a lot of vets is a heavily processed pellet as the predominant part of the diet. And it's tricky to kind of understand how that can be something that's suitable for the 300 plus species of parrots. So Jason, what are your thoughts on the fact that pellets are seen as the ultimate kind of complete diet for parrots? And, and what are your thoughts? I think it's terribly unfair to the birds. <laughs> um, you know, growing up, we were taught that enriched cereals gave us 100% of what we needed. 
And um, I've even heard human nutritionists say, well, we all turned out okay. And I, and I keep reminding people that, you know, when you look at our country in particular, obesity rates are at all time highs, heart disease, all time highs, cancers. Um, we are not okay from, from living on processed foods. And to do this to animals that have much tinier body masses, where little bits of food can have a lot of impact um, on their longevity is even more dangerous. I think we've demonized seed because that was the only thing being fed, but seed is seed has nutrients. There are benefits to seed as part of a diet, but not nothing, nothing should be the predominant part of a diet. Um, and, and I think that slap counter to what we hear um, in, in nutrition education when it comes to birds. For sure. And Jamie, what are your thoughts on some of these pellet brands that are very popular saying that they are a complete diet for a bird? I think that it's impossible for them to be a complete diet for the over 300 species of parrots. Um, nonetheless, they also offer the same formula for soft bill birds too. It doesn't make sense. So we're talking about trying to make one formula okay for well over 300 species of birds that come from very different environments in the wild. And um, it just, it, it literally doesn't make sense. And we need to be offering a much more diverse diet and offering just one food too is also really bad for the gut flora. So they have very, very, you know, lack, they have a very poor diversity of the microbiota and that can lead to GI issues. Uh, GI uh, problems are one of the most common things I see in birds that are on a sole food source. Um, it, it's it's a big problem and it's definitely not the end all be all because I do see a lot of birds that still have vitamin deficiencies when all they get is pellets and the whole point of pellets was that it's supposed to be completely nutritionally um, complete for every species but I see a lot of vitamin A deficiency a lot of calcium deficiencies uh, so it's definitely not working as a sole food source for every bird Absolutely. I'm glad you brought up the gut microbiome because that was one of my little prompts on my sheet because it is so vital to try and balance that because there's not as much research on that. But as a whole, we understand that having a healthy microbiome is essential for a healthy overall animal, let alone bird. Yeah, 100%. Cool. Jason, do you have any thoughts on the gut microbiome? Yeah, well, I have lots of thoughts because that's <laughs> definitely a research focus for us at the Animal Nutrition Lab at the university. And that's looking at um, how, how much the microbiota, all that healthy gut bacteria, for example, um, how that diversifies in the gut when you have a diverse diet um, and offer things like healthy fiber that fuels a lot of the diversification of these, these uh, gut microbes. And um, when you think about that, you have 10, you know, usually 10 times more microbes in your gut than you do human cells. Like that's kind of mind blowing, but that means that there's a reason for those, right? They, they, they help us function almost every, really every body system. Um, we don't know how that works exactly in all species, but we're seeing a lot of research emerge on the microbiome and, and what that means, you know, and how quickly it can change from just one day to the next when, when uh, the diet changes. So there's definitely a lot, a lot for us to learn, but we have to, um, we, we have to diversify the diet and, and not focus on processed foods uh, because that's going to limit the microbiome. 100%. And diversity really is key, isn't it? It's really important, just having lots of different things. And it's not only for health reasons, it's just, it's just boring just to have one type of food. If I literally had to eat nothing but cereal, which we use another example, another video, like just nothing but cereal, I'd be very bored of that. And parrots being very intelligent creatures, you know, they have the capacity to be bored easily. So they have lots of diversities, lots of different things to pack at, different textures to enjoy as well, because there's a sensory um, enrichment aspect of it, then they can enjoy it more. And if you've just got pellets, it's just one crunchy kibble. That's it, basically. Definitely. And if you guys haven't seen uh, the group talk that we did all together on David's channel, do go and watch that because there's lots more um, awesome information in there. And one of the points I raised is a lot of pellets 
they aren't nutritionally complete because the nutrients and vitamins in there are potentially unstable or just lacking. For example, there's no omega-3s in there and the uh, vitamin A is really unstable when it gets exposed to the sunlight and that kind of thing, it's it starts to break down. And by the time you get to the end of the bag, there's no vitamin A in there. And if you're not supplementing that in the diet with beta carotene and uh, vitamin A fresh foods, you're, your bird's not gonna be having any. And Jamie, you mentioned that you're seeing a lot of vitamin A deficiencies in birds. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of the most common things I see in birds that are on all pellet diet and also birds that are on an all seed diet. Uh, really, they have to be getting it in a whole food form for it to be appropriate. I can literally always tell if a bird is getting enough fresh foods. When I open their mouth, there's a groove on the roof of their mouth that has a little papillae that are nice and sharp when they're getting enough vitamin A in their diet and their mouths won't be inflamed. Um, mouth inflammation in most birds, particularly cockatiels, is really, really related to not getting enough vitamin A in their diet. And I just, I, I see that in almost every bird that I see. Um, it's probably about 10% of the birds that are really getting enough fresh foods to have enough um, appropriate vitamin A in their diet to make sure they don't have that mouth inflammation and appropriate papillae on their coena. Absolutely. And I don't know about you, Jason, but I know that our birds absolutely love foods that are packed with vitamin A. So in our experience, it's quite easy to kind of <laughs> offer that as fresh foods. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's it, none of this is difficult, um, especially because everything that you more or less need can be, you know, sourced from your local grocer. Um, you know, it's it's just a matter of um, how to prepare it so that it's species appropriate. Um, you know, offering an entire apple with the skin on it to a little tiny cockatiel probably not the best way to go, but that might work for a macaw. Um, you know, so chunking and shredding and dicing, like all experimenting, because keeping birds is a scientific experiment that never ends. It never, it, you know, we're always experimenting. So, you know, getting them foods that are high in beta carotenes. And what research has shown in human nutrition is that uh, the people with the lowest um, cardiac, uh, incident of cardiac uh, arrest are often the ones that have the highest amount of vitamin A intake, which mean, especially the deeper orange and yellow vegetables, they call that the 10 year study. It's kind of a famous study, but that 10 year study showed us that, you know, the, the deeper, the color, the more, the more rich, the, the, the vitamin A, the beta carotene, the precursor, the beta carotenes are to that. Um, that's going to have a, a really positive benefit to, to overall health. Absolutely. And, you know, which is offering so much of that diversity is so important. I mean, we get so much joy just watching our birds just enjoy fresh foods, don't we? Yeah, we like to we like to try in different ways. Like Jason said, you know, you've got shredding, you're cubing, you've got um we put them on kebabs, just let them chew the cock cockatiels love doing that, just nibbling away and chewing at it, leaving it there for them to enjoy. I want to touch it quickly as well, like about portioning quickly as well, because I see a lot of people and they offer like a, a grape to a conya. Now to a grape, us, it's tiny. But that you compare that grape to a conya's head, it's the same size as the conya's head. So it's an awful lot of fruit to be offering. And while it may seem like a little to us, you know, you need maybe need a quarter of that, a little bit of carrot, and loads of little portions of things to you know give them get them trying different things and eating them. Yeah, and the smaller the size, the more diversity you can get into the diet. So if you're just offering like a whole carrot and a bit of broccoli and a lettuce leaf, that's not raw whole food nutrition. That's just picking a couple of random things in the fridge. You know, there is a science to it to a point where you want to be offering lots of different things in order to be able to meet all those different kind of nutritional levels don't you but it's not just that as well people they use it as uh it's expensive it's more expensive than for example pellets but for example when we have our food we try to sort of almost plan our vegetables that we can have as well as the parrots so vegetables aren't are probably one of the cheapest types of food you can buy for a start so if we're combining it with our diet, then it's not very expensive. It's just prepping it basically appropriately, like Jason said and Jamie said, you know, just making sure it's appropriate. It's not it's not rocket science. It's food prep. Yeah, exactly. And when we're thinking about diet as well and diversity, you know, we've already talked about pellets. And if you choose to include pellets in your, in your diet, that's that's not a discuss discussion we're having here. Um, but some people also demonize seed because, of course, for a really long time, it was all seed diets are terrible um, after feeding birds on it for years and years. And now it's, you know, all pellets. And, and now we're moving on to raw, whole food nutrition. But I've had a lot of people actually message me saying that their vets have said that 
their birds should not have any seeds or any nuts because they're too fattening. So Jason, I can see you shaking your head. <laughs> Thoughts on seeds and nuts and whether they're fattening and if a bird should have it in their diet at all. Well, I mean, fat is not the F word. Fat is important. Um, every cell, every animal cell is wrapped in two layers of lipids. And, and you know, if you're not getting fats, you can't produce healthy cells. And fats also, I mean, fats have a host of different um, functions in the body at the cellular level on up. That being said, too much of anything, regardless of how healthy it is, can be a problem. That That's a given. But to deprive birds of fat because they think they're going to make them fat is a myth that I thought died out with research in the 1980s. Um, <laughs> Typically, what, what happens is sugars are converted to fat in the liver through a process called lipogenesis. That's where you're going to see a lot of fat get added onto to the body. Um, eating a good, healthy, balanced, you know, diverse diet with that includes fats, it shouldn't all be omega-6 fatty acids because those increase inflammation in the body. So you have to have omega-3 fatty acids to balance that out because those reduce inflammation. And I'm sure this won't be a surprise to most people, but most Western diets are completely deficient in omega-3s, which is why we probably have the, the heart problems and things like that that we have. So to, to deprive um, birds of all seeds and nuts, especially when nuts like walnuts are in the top 20 when it comes to omega-3s, but not only that, they carry so many more nutrients. They're packed with nutrients. That nut is a seed and it has a reserve of nutrients that's going to help that little seed grow into a big tree. And, it, you know, so we can capitalize on those nutrients that are that are saved within that little tiny nugget. Um, but there's fiber, there's minerals, there's healthy fats, there's proteins. There's all kinds of things. Does a bird need an entire walnut every day? No. Um, you know, if you have a macaw, you might want to give it a walnut and a pecan and maybe a filbert. Like that's, you know, a few nuts per day carry, go a long, long way. But to say that any introduction of seeds and nuts into the diet is going to make a bird obese is not true. Um, Omega-3s often will help, some of these healthy fats will help reduce body fat. Um, and we're seeing that in people too, you know, people that are eating healthier fats are you know, like avocado, you know, for human diets, not bird diets, but those are, <laughs> those help people lose weight. So, you know, if we can give our birds healthy seeds, healthy tree nuts, um, not peanuts, peanuts are not a nut. They, birds do not need peanuts. I don't care if you've offered them for 20 years, birds do not <laughs> need them. Um, they have a really poor fatty acid profile that we don't need peanuts in the diet at all. But, you know, a few sunflower seeds, very beneficial, a high vitamin E content, among other nutrients in sunflower seeds. Um, you know, like I said, walnuts, pecans, um, filberts, which are hazelnuts, uh, pine nuts, um, those are all high in omega-3 fatty acids. An almond here and there doesn't hurt. They're not, they don't have omega-3 fatty acids, but, you know, they, they still have some, some benefits to them. But your bird doesn't need a a huge handful of nuts every day. Um, you know, if you have a macaw that has a high fat need, which macaws generally do, um, and Jamie can attest to this, birds have the, some of the highest resting metabolic rates, like their heart humps. So even sitting still, they still have a high metabolism. So giving them these healthy fats are going to help them, you know, uh, maintain healthy, healthy systems, healthy body systems. Sure. And Jamie, yeah, go, go, go for it, Jamie, because I know you got a lot to say. <laughs> Yeah, no, and just first of all, I completely agree. Um, the problem with, you know, when I see overweight birds, it's more the whole picture. So it's either they're on an all seed diet and they don't get anything else, um, or they're eating a ton of unhealthy people foods. Um, most of the overweight, like Amazons, macaws, and greys that I see, they're usually um, eating what their owner's eating, which is not 
a super healthy diet. They're eating pizza crust. They're eating chicken. I, I hear that so much with these birds that they're eating meats, um, eating cheeses, eating French fries. That's really where most of these birds are becoming overweight. What I typically recommend is that people do feed their birds a healthy chop mix and then use their seeds and nuts as their uh, food rewards while they're training, because those are usually the really high value foods for a bird. And they make awesome training tools because you always want when you're training a bird to be something they can eat in like two to three seconds. So you can keep offering other cues for them to follow. Um, but that's what I rever uh, reserve the safflower and sunflower and little bits of nut pieces for. Um, so you should always have those training episodes with your bird during the day. So they have the, you know, they're getting those foods, but if you don't, for whatever reason, they can be mixed into their diet. Um, but yeah, no, I completely agree that healthy nuts are a really good source of omega threes. Um, I always recommend that people are feeding walnuts. Um, and then yes, of course, there's nothing wrong with having some seeds as long as the rest of the diet is appropriate. Um, but yeah, no, I completely agree with all of that. Oh, and when we're talking about sort of training treats and things like that, birds are going to have preferences, aren't they? So we like to do a little test. Yeah, the treat, the treat, hierarchy. treat hierarchy, the bird treat taste test. And it's very simple, <laughs> very, very simple, uh, very simple concept of a very posh name. Just lining up your bird's treats in front of them. You can even put little circles around to make it easier to identify and just see which ones they go for first, second and third. And then you can rank your treats because your bird may have a preference for sunflower seeds over hemp seeds or safflower seeds or bits of nut. They may like fruit, depending on what species they are. So you can rank them and reserve those high value for the training, like Jamie said. One other thing as well, um, some people recommend pellets for the fat reason that they're less fattening. However, J Jason actually touched on it because I've recently sort of thought about this. Certain brands, again, we can't talk about certain brands by name because of certain reasons, but certain brands are very high in sugar and colorings and additives to make them appealing to birds, especially birds who like fruit, for example, conures. And that is going to make the, the, the bird obese because there's sugars, lots of sugar in there, and they're not going to be able to burn that off, even with their high metabolism, because that's all they're getting. So it's important to keep that in mind when you're talking about pellets and a, a natural diet. Yeah, exactly. It's about sort of knowing what's in your bird's food. There's actually a brand of pellets. Again, we're not saying their <laughs> names because no one's getting sued today. But there's a brand of pellets that used to be available in the UK, a very popular brand that is now banned in the UK because of the additives and colorings that they use. So that's just something to bear in mind. It's always worth looking at what is in your bird's food. But the interesting point about, you know, some vets out there saying that you know seeds and nuts are bad is this fear around food and, and worrying about what we're offering and worrying about causing problems so uh jason i know you've got a, a few thoughts on whether we should fear food or not and um you know whether there's actually science behind feeding raw whole foods it's something i see a lot of people say well there's no data there's no papers on you know whether feeding broccoli is good to your bird and uh what are your thoughts around that <laughs> well and, and this this idea that science is completely based on peer reviewed journal articles, I mean, there's there's a lot of just um, ongoing work that helps inform us. And just because you can't, I think people misuse science by saying, "See, here's a paper. You don't have one, so you're wrong." Like that does, that's not how science works. We weaponizing science, it's it's just ridiculous. But that being said, um, when you when you look at um, what we know, a lot of it is extrapolation, right? So we we look at what human human studies have shown us, and a lot of studies on human nutrition were things tested on lab animals, right? Like, I mean, we, it, it would be unethical to test some of these things on actual people. So you know, we're looking at animals, and then we're extrapolating and saying, okay, this can be, you know, because some animal tissue is just going to respond the same way to, to different things. And so we know what nutrients do for vertebrate animals in a lot of ways. And there's variations in that, but, you know, there's, there's some basic mechanisms that hold. And so to say that, you know, you don't have a peer reviewed paper. Well, we don't have a peer reviewed paper on eating broccoli, but we know that there's benefits and we know what the nutrients are in there, right? But there's no, there's no peer reviewed paper on feeding broccoli to parrots, but we know from long periods of time that there's benefits to it because our birds aren't keeling over and dying just from eating broccoli, right? Um, so I, I, I think that there's, um, there's just a lot of like they need to win the conversation by saying what's not there. 
but there isn't research on either side, especially unbiased research. And so, you know, looking, looking at these pelleted diets that have sugars, um, for example, there's no research on the effects of sucrose, table sugar on parrots, but we know that animals don't do well eating large amounts of sucrose. Uh, it's certainly not, not humans. And we know the mechanism in the liver that turns that into fat that causes problems for, for animals, regardless of the species. So those are the types of things we know. And in science, we extrapolate and help, you know, to help inform us what's going on. What drives me really up the wall is this, this new push that all fruit is bad because it has sugar, yet they'll feed pellets that have sugar or don't feed peanuts or seeds because they're evil. And yet they'll feed a pellet that has peanuts and sunflower seeds. So those are the types of things, and Jamie's laughing because we know we've had this conversation before, but <laughs> those are the types of things that um, are really doing our birds a disservice. And people on social media seem to be more concerned with being correct than doing what's right for their animals. And that that really makes me sad. And that's why I started my group that's approaching 20,000 members because um, you know to, to have those conversations about food and not being afraid to sprout, for example, um, and how easy it is. And it only takes 36 hours and that's like 10 minutes of work in that 36 hours. Like there's so many easy ways. And when I talk to vets, vet students about how to talk to their clients about this, it's often, I use successive approximations, just like in positive reinforcement training, like let's start in steps. Here are things you can literally just soak overnight, rinse in the morning and put your birds bowl. Easy, super easy. That's seconds of work, like nothing. Um, and then you can leave that in a container and sprout for 24 hours. And that's another step. And then you can take some of that and grow it into microgreens, which might just take a few more days. And then you can start growing your own stuff on a windowsill. Like this is not rocket science. This is very basic. You can have the blackest thumb on the planet and still grow food for your birds very, very easily in a day or two. 100%. And Jamie, what are your thoughts on fearing food and the lack of science behind feeding real whole food nutrition? Well, we're never we're never going to have a double blinded placebo controlled study on feeding whole food nutrition versus feeding a pellet because how would you do that study? It, it just it's physically not possible. So we can't expect it to be that kind of science. Um, I it's the same with just taking care of yourself. I mean, you should be um, looking for diversifying the diet and not being afraid of whole foods in general. And people get so fearful over not having every meal being completely nutritionally complete. That's not how we work. I mean, we don't eat everything we need in every single meal and we can still be healthy. You can diversify diets over time and you don't have to be afraid that today you didn't meet every single nutrition requirement Environment, but you do over maybe the next week or so. That's okay. We shouldn't be afraid of that. Um, but we we physically can't have the studies to prove, you know, specifics like that. So it's not reasonable to ask that. Um, we can look at a whole food diet compared to a pellet diet um, through, you know, comparing birds' blood work, you know, making sure that, you know, we are actually meeting those requirements and that we're not seeing one group of bird being, de being deficient over the other, um, which luckily you know, people like Jason are working on that research to show that you can have perfectly healthy birds on a whole food diet. It just takes some time. But yeah, I do the same thing with my clients where if their bird comes in on all seeds or all pellets, I go, okay, well, our next step is we're going to start sprouting. It's super easy. And that's a really good way, especially for the seed junkie birds to get them into eating plants because it still kind of looks like a seed, but we've made it a more healthy alternative. It's a good place to start. And it's just so so easy that for a lot of Americans in particular that aren't really feeding themselves healthy diets, they don't know what a healthy fresh food diet would even look like, but we can start with sprouts. It, it's so easy. And that's such a nutrient packed place that to start that will add so much health to your bird. Um, and it's uh, adding fibers too, which we've kind of touched on a little bit, but fiber is if you don't get plant fibers in your bird's diet, they will 
really easily have GI disturbances and the pellets that are so high in sugar. So what happens is if there's not enough fiber in the GI tract and we have all these sugars, the wrong kind of bacteria over replicates and actually can cause more inflammation in the GI tract. So I mean, this is so important and just so easy to do. Um, but yeah, don't be afraid of foods. Don't be afraid of sprouts. Um, it, it is very, very easy to do right and kind of hard to mess up. So. Awesome. And do you have any thoughts on fearing foods? My, my thought isn't really about fearing food. It's yeah. about fearing science and fearing yeah. experimentation. Like, don't be afraid to experiment and try new things. If you are on all seed or all pellets, you know, try the sprouting, try soaking, try, try vegetables in your purr. They might not take to it immediately, but keep trying and see if they like it. And I don't like the way a lot of people do tend to treat discussions. They should be discussions rather than arguments on diet and nutrition as wars or things that have to us be, uh, them. yeah, it, do, it doesn't have to be us versus them. Yeah. It can be a discussion. It doesn't need to be one. You don't need to so shout, show me a paper repeatedly. You know, we're all, well, most of us are adults and even a lot of teenagers and children have the maturity to discuss things in a logical and good way. So please keep your, keep an open mind basically. Yeah. And there's definitely going to be biased science because of course, you know, pellet brands are going to want you to buy their pellets. So they're going to test for certain things and perhaps not test for certain things that aren't legally required, which, you know, may pop up later in life. Um, and there are just so many variables. When we talk about making dry mixes, which you're really passionate about, there are so many different ingredients in there. And it's, it's very tricky to run a, um, a study that's going to tick all the boxes to a scientific paper that people want to see. Um, but I'm glad we brought up sprouting because I want to bust a myth right here and now. Um, one of the things I've been seeing for so long on social media is feeding your bird sprouts is going to make them hormonal. And that drives me crazy because, again, it creates this fear of food. You should never feed sprouts. So, Jason, we're, it's just we're going straight at you, Jason. Let's talk about sprouts and being hormonal and that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, I've seen people who just create this story in their head about springtime and sprouts and like they just they want to connect it all it's it's just not no no um <laughs> sprouts are not going to make your birds hormonal um like i said it's more about sudden dietary changes where they get this huge influx like i've seen people give their african gray a plate full of food like a half a squash and it's piled with sprouts. like that's going to make a bird hormonal if they're not consistently getting that every day. Like we need to be reasonable here. Look at portion control because foraging does not mean you're like going over overboard with portion control, but it's the types of foods. Like when you look at the nutrients and sprouts versus um, other types of foods that are commonly fed to birds, like pasta, pasta is not healthy. We have been taught that it's healthy. The, 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 a lot of people think pasta is healthy. Pasta is not healthy. It's a comfort food. And the Association of Avian Vets just released something the other day on their social media channels that says avoid mushy, you know, soft and, um, and or warmed foods because that's what they see triggers hormones, right? Triggers these behaviors. And so but the the like David said the, the the hills that people die on over nutrition like I've never seen the the vile just arguments over you know demanding that you're you 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 submit to their claims that the food they're feeding is okay pasta is not a healthy food rice overall really is not a healthy food if you I would I would get darker rices and sprout them. But like, you know, cooked rice, all this warm, soft food is comfort foods for us. So we assume that it's good for the birds. It is not healthy. And, um, you know, this, this idea that uh, we have to, um, I don't know, cater to the birds likes, like, <laughs> just because they like it doesn't mean it's good for them. That's, that's a huge, huge problem. My bird loves it. So it must be okay. I like lots of things that are bad for me. Mm -hmm. too. <laughs> yeah, pizza every day sounds great but i'm not going to end up in a good state um exactly. but we see a lot of sometimes like mushy chops fed to birds and we see that trigger hormones don't we yeah we see a lot of mushy mushy food is definitely a problem warm food as everyone's mentioned mushy foods you know and 
um, it sometimes can happen when you freeze a chop, yeah. for example. You freeze a chop, you batch do it, and there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. You know, freezing is probably better than other things, but you might want to take some of that moisture content out. And we generally recommend um, just putting some like dried flowers in there, maybe trying to strain it a little bit just to get some of it out because it's, it's not ideal, but it's a lot better than having a mushy food, basically. Yeah, definitely. And Jamie, your thoughts on whether sprouts trigger hormones based on what you've seen? <laughs> I've never seen that happen. Um, and I do see a lot of birds with hormone problems. Uh, so I, I don't think that that is really a thing at all. Um, but I have learned I have to be more careful when people tell me they're feeding their bird a chop and I have to ask if it's cooked because I just assumed everyone was doing the raw chop when they say that. And I had a client the other day that was doing everything right. Everything was wonderful. And then they went through, they started listing what was in their chop. And I was like, oh my gosh, they're just literally cooking cooking everything and I was like you can feed that raw everything you're doing you don't have to cook it and they were like well I was told that they digest it better if it's cooked I'm like this is not a problem for your bird they're not underweight and we don't have a problem with that like literally you're just take out a step of what you're doing just cut it up and you're, you're done just mix it <laughs> like you're fine um, but yeah, no, I, I sprouts are not going to cause your bird to be hormonal. Having too many calories and having too abundant of food, meaning just too much food, is what's going to make them hormonal. And I mean, just speaking for Americans in general, we hate portion control. We just hate it. Um, <laughs> but it's something that you have to learn to do. Everyone's got a tablespoon in their house and they can measure their bird's food out. But people look at me like I'm crazy when I tell them a cockatiel eats about a tablespoon of food a day. And they are like, no, no, no they go through so much food like no they're picking out the parts they want they're not getting a complete diet even if you're doing everything and you're doing a fresh chop and everything's great but you're feeding too much they're picking out the parts they want so they're not getting a complete diet or you're not blending it well enough um but yeah no every day people come in with seed bowls that are full to the brim and i'm like that is like a week's worth of food plus you know that's why your bird's hormonal besides the fact that it's not a complete diet um but yeah no sprouts are fine sprouts are good <laughs> and we've sort of touched upon you know what vets know about nutrition and that kind of thing and expanding our knowledge with nutrition Jamie what would you suggest to people maybe wanting to create a conversation with their vet is it okay to question your vet's dietary recommendations is that allowed and, and how can we create a, a dialogue where we're all learning together I think it's completely reasonable to ask your vet why they're recommending something and I think that that will open up a dialogue as to, you know, where that information comes from. And they're probably going to say, well, the experts recommend that we feed 80 to 90 percent pellets. But where did that come from and why can't we try it another way? And what will make the vet feel comfortable with you offering a fresh whole food diet? Does it mean that you come in at the six month mark rather than a year mark for blood work just to make sure that your bird is healthy? And that's good information for both you and your vet. So they can start to be more comfortable with different types of feeding as well. And um, it's completely reasonable that you can feed a completely nutritionally um, formulated diet on your own where you are feeding just a variety of different foods. Um, but, you know, the problem is vets see that go wrong. We see people do dietary drift over time where they go, well, I stopped adding carrots because my bird just didn't really like them. And I stopped adding greens because it didn't seem like he was eating the greens. So I just started offering more fruits. And that I hear a lot because people will shift it because they like, I didn't like wasting the food. You were wasting like an ice cube size <laughs> amount of food. Like, just waste it. You know, it's fine. Offer it. And it you're it's not a huge amount of food waste. You waste more than that in your fridge just for getting you brought asparagus last week, you know, and so just do it. Um, but yeah, no, there has to be open communication. And uh, unfortunately, if your vet won't talk to you about it, you might need to find someone that that will talk to you about it. Um, because people are going to offer, you know, whatever diet, and really, it's helpful for the vet to have a conversation with their client rather than just shut down the conversation. Um, but also, it comes back to convenience. We don't have a lot of time. So it's hard to really walk through each and everything someone's feeding. Um, that's why I have my technicians go into room and just get a list, get a list of everything they're feeding. So I have that before I go in. So I know what to talk about with them. Um, but yeah, it has to be an open conversation. Otherwise, we're doing a disservice to the client. We're doing a disservice to ourselves and we're doing a disservice to the bird. Definitely. And Jason, what are your thoughts on creating an open dialogue and, and how we can approach that? 
I mean, if you can't have an open dialogue with any of the medical professionals that are impacting you or your birds, you you need to you need to find somebody else to go to. Um, vets are busy. Vets are specialists in surgery and medicine. They're vital to birds' health. They're critical in every way. But when it comes to nutrition, I would not go to my medical doctor to talk about my diet any more than I would go to a veterinarian to talk about the diet um, or ch changes to the diet, I should say. Um, but if you have a vet, like my dog vet is very open in talking about the fact that he's on a raw food diet and he's very healthy. But I just, I, I and, and you see this on my, my Facebook group, we hear from people all the time, like, well, I told my vet that I was feeding a raw food diet and you know, the vet was very unhappy and said that that bird needs to be on pellets. And I said, well, what symptoms does your bird have? And they never have any symptoms. They're fine. So I don't know why would we, we why would we change something that's, that's working just because someone heard once that pellets are good. I mean, it's, it's really, it's really asinine. It, it doesn't make any sense to me, but if you can't have a working dialogue with a very reasonable medical professional like like Dr. Jamie here, um, you need to find somebody else to talk to. Definitely, what are your thoughts on creating discussions that are healthy about, not just with vets, but just in general with you know how we approach social media? It ties thing. back to what we said in the last point really about being mature and having a discussion and being open-minded to all these things, yeah. you know, and not attacking people and it's, it's going like you talked jason just mentioned it's almost people go with the trend it's the the established thinking so people just follow total line even when the whole food diet's working for their bird you know it's completely fine they're happy the bird is not showing any symptoms or negative uh, impacts some people will be swayed by that by that vet's opinion purely because it's a vet and they said i i, I say this and they don't question it so be open do question things and do think for yourself and have a dialogue if as everyone said i'm just mirroring what you guys said have if you can't get a dialogue with the, the your current vet maybe you should consider talking to someone else as well yeah and do your own research and bring your own ideas to the vet and say this is what i've learned and jason's group is perfect for that so i have lots of links in the video description of things that you can go and look at afterwards different resources and stuff like that i have my diet playlist where you can learn about different things because expanding your mind on what is safe to offer is just as important as asking somebody you know you can do the research yourself and see what's out there um, and see what you can start adding because again you can start small it doesn't have to be a complete drastic change because in some ways doing a drastic change is potentially bad you know there's lots of different potential digestive upsets or your bird just completely not enjoying that you can do it as a, a slow gradual change the key is to just start and start changing things for the better um, and, and don't thought, rely on social media yes don't don't rely, don't. social media is just this war zone where everyone can be an expert and the reason I started my group in 2014, like a long time ago, was I got kicked out of parent nutrition groups because I was questioning the status quo. I was questioning people who were not qualified, who don't understand the science behind these things. And I was removed from those groups, not for being inflammatory, just for just for voicing truth and um you know, you, you really need to go. And what we know about how adults learn is that, you know, we need 30 to 100 hours of exposure to education in an area over six to 12 months for it to stick. So join a group that's healthy, that is that has no drama, that's not inflammatory, where you can be in a safe space and continue to learn and get exposed to all these different ways of doing things um, so that you are kind of figuring things out as you go um, and, and avoid any, leave the groups, just your presence in a group reinforces that they're doing good things if they're, if they're not being nice. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> just the thought is, it's just the ego that you get on social media and the fear of being wrong. Like me and Sophie, we're not scared of being wrong. If we find a concept that we previously thought was correct and we are, we're shown it's wrong we're happy to adapt and i think the lack the the rigidity of people especially on social media the need to be right the need to be perfect and to portray perfection it drives me nuts i see it all the time especially with behavior mm. and having to be right just just drop it guys come on we don't have to be right leave the ego at the door we're all looking after parents we're all trying to do our best and we want them to thrive 
so just yeah ditch the ego guys please um, one of the things that we love as people on social media um <laughs> is ask us why you know don't just take what we say for you know what we're saying yeah ask us why we think that way why does it work? yeah no, <laughs> <laughs> not like some of the comments we've had ask us why ask us how this works why is this beneficial why you not recommend that because again asking questions you're going to gain more knowledge instead of just blindly believing something whether that's what we're sort of discussing here or other things that you're finding on social media um, but I thought we would kind of round off this talk with going around and seeing what everyone would like, the kind of the message you would like to give to people watching this, power owners, about nutrition and what are some of the key things that you would like to just say to people um, with all kind of things considered, with this talk considered just about power nutrition. So we'll start with Jason. What message would you like to send to power owners watching this? Um, stop fearing food and get a better understanding on what food is really unhealthy if you don't already know. Like we said, pasta, bread, things like that, that's that's not healthy for anybody, including us, as much of a tough pill to swallow that is. <laughs> knowing, you know, knowing, um, knowing what's healthy and not giving up. Mm -hmm. Don't offer something one time to your bird and say, well, they don't like it, I'm done. Like they could need exposure to that or mixing that with recognizable foods for weeks to months before they actually try it or preparing it in a different way. Like we said, chunking or dicing or shredding or, or whole, um, you know, experiment and try to be consistent for a while to see if you can get your birds eating something because your bird will indeed eat anything you want it to. It's more persistent on your part than it is theirs. Definitely. And there are lots of different things that we can offer our birds. And Jason, would you like to talk about your new endeavor of biodiversity bird blends and how that can kind of impact on a bird's diet and some of the, the goodies on the on the range of that? <laughs> so um, I breed toucans and I have for 25 years. And one of the things that they're prone to is iron storage disease. It's called hemochromatosis. And it's not just toucans, it's starlings and minas and lorries and lorikeets and even other species like lemurs. And so zoos have been offering teas to them, like decaffeinated black tea in order to, for those tannins to bind to the dietary iron. And so it doesn't, you know, toxify their liver. And Dr. Karen Becker, many of you know her because she's the most followed vet on the planet. Um, she came and did a talk over 10 years ago at our club about this. And I'm like, this is what we're doing. Like we need to do more with this. And so we developed a, a line of teas that birds, really any animal can, can uh, partake in so that they're getting nutrients in their water as well as mixed in with their food. Like there's many different ways. So we have a line of those, um, including like dry foraging blends that are all different types of dried flowers that you can blend in with the food. So you can just layer nutrition in very easily um, in these nice convenient packages. Um, all of it's whole food, none of it's processed. And now we're adding things like sprouts and uh, we will be adding new things over the next few weeks um, as well. So that 100% whole unprocessed foods can be got in one place and, and introduced to your birds. Oh, very exciting. So I've linked- And it all that. helps to fund, it all helps to fund the research in the animal nutrition lab too. I gotta say that because it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> if you guys want to see the science behind raw whole food nutrition then you've got to support the brand so there'll be links down in the description <laughs> if you want to learn more if you want the science that's how you get it um it's very exciting um jamie what are your thoughts on what you'd like to say to parrot owners as a vet um on parrot nutrition yeah and the long and short of it is don't be afraid to ask questions and don't be afraid to diversify your bird's diet um you know just offer a bunch of different things birds see in a whole uh, visual spectrum that we don't even see so sometimes it really is just the way that you offered it, it didn't look right that day you know so just keep trying different ways um don't give up because that's really what i see the most they're like ah, i tried that my bird my bird just didn't like greens so i just stopped you could have shoved greens to the cage bars you could have diced it up and mixed it with the food your bird was already eating you could have tried it uh, so many different ways and don't tell your vet that you just got tired of wasting food literally it's so such a small amount of food especially if we're talking about you know one green cheek conure or one cockatiel you're not wasting very much food and you should be eating these things too so it, you are eating the things that they're not eating so um but yeah it just comes down to don't be afraid to diversify your 
your bird's diet. There's so many benefits to it. And just think about it logically. It doesn't make sense to feed one thing and think that that's going to meet all of an animal's nutrition requirements. It doesn't make sense, especially when we're talking about a category like birds, where it's so diverse. There's over 10,000 species of birds. There's over 300 species of parrots. There's no way that one thing is going to be the right thing for all of those birds. So diversify so we can do our best to meet their nutritional needs in captivity. Amazing. And um, David, what would you like to share with everybody? Uh, that'd be a great experiment in different ways. Think outside the box as well. We recommend herbs a lot, fresh herbs as a mm -hmm. conversion tool for diet, and they work really well. You know, even if you can encourage a budgie, for example, budgie's bathing response, <laughs> a leaf of lettuce, they may nibble on that. So mm -hmm. give them, give everything a try. And don't be afraid to apply it to yourself as well, because we do eat rubbish, us humans. I'm trying to improve my diet. <laughs> so, you know, it's it's all right for us, so it's all right for our birds. So make sure everyone's improving their diet. And just, yeah, as everyone else, mirroring everyone else, what they said, don't be afraid to experiment and just keep trying. Yeah, and I am actually planning a video on why birds do waste some food. So make sure you're sticking around, notification bell on, subscribe, all the, all the jazz like that, um, as to why that actually happens, because it is a natural kind of behaviour uh, for a variety of different natural history reasons. So that's coming up soon. But I'd like to say a massive thank you to all of you for being here today, not only watching, but also my special guests. I really appreciate your time today. And I hope you guys have really enjoyed this video. If you have any questions about parrot nutrition, drop them down in the comments because I would love to speak to you. And don't forget to check out the description of the video because there'll be lots of resources in there for you to check out afterwards. But in the meantime, thank you so much for watching. Take care and see you later.